Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know folks are trickling in as the webinar opens. <clears throat> so glad you chose to spend your Wednesday morning with us. My name is Kyler. I'm the state and local policy analyst for People for Bikes. We'll give people just a minute as they're trickling in. We have quite a crowd today. So I wanna make sure everyone gets set up. All right, I still see the numbers climbing, but slowing down. Um, thank you all for being here uh, for People for Bikes May segment of our monthly industry webinar series. This month's conversation is about the bicycle supply chain. As you can see on our title slide, both at current state and understanding opportunities within the market. As an aside, you are here for a hot topic. We had nearly double our number of usual registrants for this morning. Um, so I'm thrilled to pass the mic in just a minute to our three experts who will guide you through the content. I wanna remind everyone that you are welcome as always to take notes, but we will send out a recording and copy of the slides to everyone who registered today. We'll spend about 60 minutes together. You know, uh, Normally we're 30, but given sort of the timeliness and the interest on this topic, we wanted to extend it for everyone. The first 45 minutes being presentation and the final 15 being Q&A. So please make sure that you're using Zoom's Q&A feature in the bottom of your screen to write in questions so our panelists can be ready for answers when we get to that portion. And now for our three panelists, we have Patrick Hogan, a dear colleague of mine at People for Bikes, our bicycle industry research manager, Andrew Kemp um, with Shimano, a senior manager there, and John Williams, president at Norco. With that, let me pass it off to Patrick to walk us through the agenda and kick us off. Awesome, thank you, Kyler. Um, I'm gonna push back a little bit. I think there's two experts on this panel and one BFB staffer who's giving Andrew and John the, the platform to really describe uh, from their point of view what the supply chain looks like and what we think it will look like in the future. So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Patrick Hogan. I am the Bicycle Industry Research Manager at People for Bikes, overseeing all of our studies of participation, market sales and consumer insights. And today my duties also include serving as your moderator for this small panel of industry experts. So as the researcher, industry researcher at People for Bikes, I receive a lot of questions from folks um, about the supply chain, worried about the supply chain, when's the supply chain gonna go back to normal, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so we wanted to share some insights from um, some of the top minds in the industry uh, and, and really share some ideas to take home. So we're gonna use three questions to guide our discussion today. And you'll see on the agenda, these are two, three, and four. Uh, we'll spend a few minutes talking about how the supply chain worked before the pandemic, as well as how the supply chain is working right now. And then we're gonna spend the bulk of time discussing how we think the supply chain could or should work in the future. So throughout these topics, we're going to describe the supply chain using the following variables. Um, goods, so like whether that's materials or finished products, but, but things. Um, information, dollars, and then risk. So our, our goal today is to spark conversations and, and get us thinking about the supply chain that we want to have. Um, we're obviously not here to assign blame or rehash analyses that have been covered in so many other webinars over the past two years or like lecture anybody on what they should be doing. Um, and after our webinar today, I of course would invite anyone and everyone to uh, continue this conversation in whatever way makes sense for you. I and People for Bikes, we're here to serve as a resource for the industry. Um, so let us know how we can keep this conversation going to better be of service to you. Uh, so again, we have Andrew and John joining us. Um, I'm excited to have both of y'all here. Let's jump in. I mentioned the first question guiding our discussion is how did the supply chain work before the pandemic? So I want to focus on this for a few minutes. Andrew, can you walk us through how those variables I brought up earlier, things, materials, finished products, um, dollars, information, and risk, defined the pre-pandemic supply chain. Sure, thanks Patrick. And thank you for um, the other panelists and support from People for Bikes as well as everybody uh, taking time to, uh, to join this. That's uh, 
this is obviously a super interesting and um, valuable topic and timely, but of course there's not uh, there's no easy answers. Um, the uh, the way it seemed to work in the past um, was there was we were moving away from kind of a very very traditional timely everybody launches product at the same time everybody receives product in the same cadence and it was more of a more kind of the whole market operating like a factory with throughput you have the things you need when you need them and you don't have the things you don't need when you don't need them and so warehouses were expected to have parts almost all the time and retailers were doing a reasonably good job of using their best judgment to place orders for the coming season but not over committing and not exposing themselves too much in any particular category so i think you know that in general sort of encapsulates it i think we have some other factors as we well know that coming into 2019 we had less bikes in the North American channel um, than ever before, in part driven by the tariffs out of China. So we just had less inventory to start in particularly in finished bikes. Um, so that set us up for <laughs> some real challenges um, once uh, Q2 of 2020 hit. Yeah, that's something that, um can get overlooked is that that setup um, coming into 2019. So, so let's think about how, like what information was available in that pre-pandemic market and how we used it to make decisions. We being whatever player in the industry we want to take the role of for this, for this exercise. But um, if we look at five, 10, 20 years before the pandemic, demand didn't fluctuate a whole lot. It would be just one, two, 3%, either up or down, but you know, compared to other markets, relatively stable. And that establishes sort of a, um, a business as usual mindset and doesn't necessarily um, highlight the need for high level research to, to identify um, huge opportunities or, or mitigate huge risks that might come up. We're playing within these bounds that are pretty close. Um, and so I think that it would be fair to say that that gives us a mindset that doesn't um, doesn't prioritize a discussion about risk. Do you think that's fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you were to look at, um, like you were saying, the up or down, if you look at U.S. import stats, you would have kind of swings year to year but if you averaged them out it was very very stable for a very long time and it was mostly just movement around different categories right as road was declining mixed surface or gravel was rising mountain bike was moving out of you know your more traditional kind of hardtail front suspension categories more and more into 29 inch full suspension etc cetera, etc cetera. so it yeah it wasn't it was fairly static and didn't require a high level of complex analysis. Yeah, one other factor that I might throw in there that, that's of interest and, and can also get overlooked is the fact that purchase cycles kind of get um, drawn out a little bit longer as the technology gets a little bit better. It's not, we don't have these huge leaps in technology every two, three, four, five years like we might have had in the 90s or the early 2000s. Um, you can buy a bike in 2010 and it'll last you a little bit longer because we're getting these marginal increases to technology that aren't necessarily bringing consumers to the market saying, hey, I've got to have whatever it is, that, that next new thing. Um, so, so going back to risk for just a second, if we think about that mindset where we're not super... Um, or we're not mindful about the risk that exists because the risk is really pretty minuscule. Do you think you can describe kind of where that risk landed and, and with the understanding that everybody, every player in this supply chain and the market um, from the consumer all the way up to the top assume some level of risk. And so, so the point here isn't to point fingers at anyone, but really to describe how all of these variables interacted with one another 
and and um, created this marketplace that we had before the pandemic. Sure, I think um, I think the where the the most risky part <laughs> was a lack of clarity across the channel about where who was adopting what risk. Right, it wasn't clear to everybody involved where the level of risk that retailers were taking or distributors slash wholesalers were taking versus importers. And then, and that's just on the ground here in North America. And then once you go overseas, the assemblers were taking a lot of risk, but it was predicated on a very stable market. And I think not having clarity about who was taking or exposed to what risk and having understanding from top to bottom, I think that was <laughs> the biggest misplaced risk, right? I, I wouldn't, I don't think it would be entirely fair to say any single party was a, holding more risk than anybody else because it sure felt yeah. like everybody had their fair share of risk. Um, I think it came down more to a lack of clarity about what the type of risk, the nature of risk that each party was holding. And I think this pandemic set us up quite well to get a very, very fast and aggressive course in understanding that a little more clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Fast and aggressive, I think, would be um, pretty accurate, looking back at the past 24 or so months. Yeah. Um, this is all really helpful. So, John, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Do you have anything to add to um, Andrew's account of the historic supply chain kind of what what we saw in the years leading up to the pandemic and, and what we thought of as like a normal supply chain. Uh, you know, I think Andrew did a pretty good job describing it. Uh, I, I, I do want to make one statement up front. I, I don't consider myself an expert. <laughs> I consider myself a participant in this and I have lots of lots of observations on, on what's happened. Uh, you know, with respect to dollars, I, I go back to the NPD and if we if we think of the bicycle market in the US on a sell through basis, it, it had been about a six billion dollar market for the past 20 years or so. It would, you know, adjust a few percentage up or down each year. And then as we got into COVID, uh, I think it's, it reached its peak of about nine and a half billion dollars last summer. And so it went up 50% in about 18, uh, in, in about 18 months. I think we know that just puts in enormous strain and stress on, on really all the stakeholders uh, in, in, in the supply chain. Yeah, I think that's um, an incredibly fair statement to make, an enormous strain and stress on just about everyone. Yeah. Um, well, if, if that's all we got on the historic supply chain, that's a perfect transition into our current supply chain. So in this environment of strain and stress and, um, you know, a, a new set of constraints and limitations that we're having to deal with while we're trying to get products to the market. John, I'm going to turn it right back over to you. Um, to give us an overview of, of the current supply chain and kind of a lay of the land of where we are now, how dollars are moving up and down the supply chain, how products moving across the supply chain, um, how we're using information and then like where that risk now is landing. Yeah, good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Yeah. And again, I think we should recognize when we're talking supply chain, we're talking all the way downstream from the consumer. How do we get the consumer a, a bike and all the way back up to, to really to really, in essence, to raw material sourcing? Uh, and so, you know, all those touch points uh, along the line, uh, what's what's happening at those various touch points? And really, we don't have time today to, to go over all those touch points. I, I think the other thing we should recognize uh, before COVID really hit us in North America uh, in 2020 in, in the Chinese New Year, uh, often the, the plants are shut down for, you know, for one or two weeks, the workers go home to their families. Uh, what we found in 2020, only about 50 to 60% of the workers actually migrated back to the factories in, in February 2020. And so when we hit COVID in March 2020 in, in North America, the factories in Asia were, were not at full capacity at that point in time. We're not even at capacity, you know, what, what they were achieving in, in, in 2019. And then they were hit with all these order cancellations. Right. I mean, it was doom and gloom out there uh, in, you know, in the economy. Certainly, I put my hand up. I, I thought uh, we were going to go off a financial abyss here. And, and that's how we planned our business. Uh, we were deferring or canceling orders in, in March and leading into April until we got indicators 
uh, that you know what, holy mackerel, there's the, there there could be a boom happening, and so it probably took the industry and and some players were much faster at this than others, uh, just recognizing that that hey, we're going to have a boom here during COVID, and and you know I I don't know anyone <laughs> who could put up their hand and said they predicted that. I am sure you know uh, revisionism will occur, and some people will say I saw that coming, and so really the industry was not set up to uh, to to account for this boom. Uh, you know, because again, we just all cancel our, our order books. Uh, so what did we realize? I mean, our supply chain in the industry has been built for, uh, for uh, efficiency. You know, we've all heard the term just in time inventory, right? You know, brands are telling dealers just just order in time, don't carry too much inventory. Same thing with with wholesales and suppliers. They just want to have you know so many days inventory in, in their warehouses. We're all trying to optimize our turns. Uh, I think what's going to transition into the future is we need a supply chain based on agility uh, and, and robustness. And so there may be a little more inefficiencies built into the supply chain going forward just to account for the surges and contractions in, in demand. Uh, personally, I will say I have a lot of empathy for the, for our frontline people in the industry, uh, you know, you, you know, uh, uh, sales staff uh, on the dealers floors, customer service teams uh, in the suppliers. Uh, because we couldn't give them information when product was gonna, going to arrive. And, and you know, in, in my mind, one, one of the things of, a, of, a, of an optimal supply chain is just full transparency of where product is in the supply chain and, and you, know, you know, coupled with shorter lead times. Uh, again, this means that all stakeholders can order with confidence knowing the product will arrive as promised at the time of order taking. Uh, you know, what we saw during COVID and we're still seeing a little today is, is the, uh, this, uh, you know, everyone's overselling, it seems like, and, you know, and I question and, you know, I'll, I'll look internally, is it done in a reckless manner? Uh, you know, I, I think many brands, uh, we had order books that were probably eight times, eight, maybe even 10 times larger than they were, 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 were historically. You know, we have consumers coming into the doors or placing uh, deposits with multiple dealers, and they're willing to accept the first bike that lands from, from you know, whichever brand. That's, that, that's, that's not a stable supply chain, right? So we, we you know, we've, we've certainly sold uh, over capacity. Uh, so we have to get back to where we're selling to capacity. Uh, and, and we just need that ability to tell consumers when product is, is going to arrive and let consumers decide how long they're willing to wait for product. Uh, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting a bit closer. Uh, what I've looked at through this is what are the leading indicators? And I, I think a learning for, you know, which is maybe not a learning, but it was reinforced is again, the further downstream you go, it can change much quicker there, the environment uh, than it can upstream. And, and so, you, you know, there's a lot more risk as you go upstream in, in terms of, of, of making bets on what the future is, is going to look like. Uh, and, that, and that's a challenge we have. Uh, the other thing in today's supply chain uh, and certainly over the last couple of years is uh, dealers have been prepaying and paying cash up front for product. Uh, and so suppliers in, in some respects were flush with capital, but what's also happened is this capital has just moved upstream because we've had our manufacturers who, who their inventory levels have, again, I'm, I'm just kind of picking multiples here, uh, you know, have gone up, uh, you know, five, six, seven X. Uh, because they have all these components uh, in their warehouses, but they don't have enough components to build a complete bike. And they've run out of capital. Uh, they, uh, they want now the brands who have placed these orders to, to give uh, deposits on the inventory that they have to source in order to buy the bikes. And so I see that this, this, this transfer of capital moving from, from dealers to, to suppliers and brands all the way upstream to, uh, to manufacturers. Uh, you know, dating, right? Dating uh, has, has probably been almost non-existent during COVID. Uh, DSO went way down for, for many suppliers. Uh, like I say, there was a lot of cash downstream and it, it just really migrated all the way upstream. Uh, the other thing that I found very interesting, and again, just an observation, is in companies uh, and, you know, I'd say suppliers and, and manufacturers, and, and I guess even dealers to a certain extent, is, is how we allocated the limited product that we had, you know, which markets were prioritized, which customers and, and which channels. I, I think most stakeholders kind of claimed uh, pre-COVID FIFO, 
you know, first in, first out. Uh, no preference was given to customers based on their size or importance. I think what we saw during COVID is many brands, and, and I would even say, you know, dealers and, and customers that walk in their doors, we started uh, segmenting our, our customer base and giving priority to those, those, those stakeholders who we viewed as more important. Uh, and, and usually that's, that, that ties around scale and, and size definitely matters. Uh, some brands would try to understand the capacity of their suppliers and then allocate uh, their, their bike allotment to dealers. Rather than asking dealers what they want, they would go out to dealers and say, this is what we think we're gonna get. Are you willing to take this? Uh, that's still a customer segmentation strategy. Uh, so, you, you know, there was, there was a lot of uh, what I would call customer segmentation strategies that went on during COVID. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where I see the, the supply chain is. I think we're slowly coming out of it. Uh, we, we see uh, uh, certain categories, particularly on, on the bike side, filling up with product, you know, lower price point hardtails, some urban stuff, some commuter stuff, uh, where we still see some, uh, some, some shortages is full suspension, uh, MTB, and some of the e-bike categories. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, I will say about this uh, again, very interesting to see those categories that really accelerated to, uh, during COVID and really asking ourselves what are going to stick in a post-COVID world and, and how I look at it. I'm not saying this is right, but uh, those categories that, that were, were moving positively pre-COVID and accelerated during COVID, I, I have the most comp uh, confidence that's going to stick in, in a post-COVID world. Uh, those categories that were relatively flat pre-COVID and maybe bounced during COVID will probably come back to their, their 2019 norms uh, in, in a post-COVID world. That's what I have, uh, Patrick. That's amazing. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for that overview. I, I'm going to send it to you, Andrew, in just a minute to expand on any areas that, um, that you might be seeing. But John, I want to, I want to go back for a second and highlight uh, the, the few times in there that you brought up the use of information. So, so you mentioned, and you know, we, we all know this, but like early in the pandemic, March, 2020 canceling orders. Um, and that's based on, on some source of information, right? Like that's based on our, um, historic market in 2008, nine, whenever it was, when, um, there was a recession starting and, and we saw how bike demand adjusted based on, um, uh, disposable income at the consumer level, right? So, so this is kind of the first time that we're using information during the COVID market to inform our plays here. Now, we all wish that we hadn't canceled those orders in 2020, in, in March, 2020, but um, you know, 24, five, six months later, it's easy to say that. You also mentioned leading indicators of like what's happening with demand as we're going through these changes. This like historic surge in demand um, where, where are we going to end? Are we going to plateau? Are we going to climb forever? Uh, what, what do we expect? Um, so, so what I'm hearing now is a lot more reliance on data and on research in using new indicators other than sort of this like business as usual um, that, that we've been very comfortable with pre-pandemic. Not to say that we hadn't used information, but we're looking for a lot of new sources of information now. Um, you mentioned that dealers are placing orders like eight to 10 times larger than normal. Uh, do you have a sense for what information they're basing those increased numbers on? Sorry, I, I didn't mean dealers. I meant uh, okay. suppliers were taking orders and order books were, you know, a multiple of the historical norms. Uh, got it, got it. Right. And so, uh, I mean, you know, what what we thought was happening is is uh, we, you know, again, I, I don't know this with the fact that dealers may have been placing uh, large orders of multiple brands and and really waiting for the first order to arrive, you know, and, and hey, we were all wondering what was going to happen with demand. I mean, we, we can understand why that was happening. Uh, but when you looked at all the orders that were out there, it, it would probably be an industry that was five or six, <laughs> you know, maybe seven times larger than it was in a pre-COVID in a, in, in pre world. 
so that that's just challenging when you look at the data. I, I, I mean, I, I, I think what many of us did is, is we really took out our recession playbook and that's how we tried to manage our way through through COVID. And we realized uh, a totally new playbook is, uh, is, is one that has to be written uh, to, to account for all the uncertainties and all the events that, that happened during COVID. I mean, God forbid, but if we ever get into another pandemic, uh, let's say in 10, 10 years time, uh, I, I think we will all be, uh, you know, better served having going through this pandemic. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see what, what we all do at the, at, at the on start with respect to orders, right? We, we yeah. all anticipate another surge in, 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 in cycling demand. Yeah, let's not say 10 years time, let's say 50, 60, 70. Okay, I think I okay. Well, about in the that. future, we'll say, right? I'd like to say, <laughs> God forbid, hey, let's hope it doesn't happen. Absolutely. Um, Andrew, anything that you'd like to add to our, our like current landscape, what we're seeing in the supply chain right now? Um, sure. I One, I want to highlight what, uh, what John said about the agile supply chain, I think is such a, a, a terrific way to think and i and i believe we as the industry can and should have some more and longer term discussions about that because we go back to the risk what kind of risk are we willing to accept is it slower pace of product development is it higher cost on product you know what is the what what do we get for that agility and what do we have to pay for to get that agility. So I think that's, it's a really good point that we should keep circling back to. Another thing I think it's really important to think about is how we as people all made it through um, or experienced this pandemic. By and large, it seems like humanity um, has re, like revalued time. And I think that figures into a lot of these types of discussions as we think about what is important? What do I want to spend my time on? And then where is the friction, right? If we think about the rise in food delivery services, one, of course, it was easy because you couldn't go out and now somebody put food on your, on your porch. But you start to realize that there's friction reduced in the getting of that food to you. And we're all like making decisions about our personal supply chains as well as the bike supply chain. And how can we think about that reduction of friction because we've experienced it in our own lives. And then you, back to my prior statement about the value of time and what do I want to spend my time doing? I think those are lessons that we came out of, are coming out of this with. We don't yet know how to apply them, but I think they're very, very worth noting as, as lessons learned. And how can we, as we're moving towards a you know, kind of transitional phase, um, thinking about that agile supply chain, where is that value of time and time spent doing what? And then, you know, how do we reduce that friction to getting goods? Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, I hadn't thought about it that way, that the pandemic really highlighted ways that we can reduce friction. Um, and now we're all looking to continue that reduced friction interaction into the future, whether that is food coming to my doorstep or interacting differently with the, the bicycle marketplace. So all this context is super helpful. Um, now that we've talked about like the historic supply chain, kind of what's happening right now, um, let's think about possible future supply chains. Like what do we think the future is gonna look like? Um, how, how do we think it's gonna be defined? And like, how do these variables that we've been talking about goods, dollars, information, and risk interact with our supply chain in five, 10 years. Andrew, I'm gonna throw it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, you know, I think the um, John spoke to it sort uh, tangentially or, or kind of glancingly, but you know, the idea that we experienced 10 years of growth in these last 24 months cannot be missed, right? Like that's, there's, you can't, it's almost like if I sit and think about it too long, I'm not, I'm just going to stare uh, blankly into the camera because that's just too insane to think about. So, but it, it needs to really be paid attention to because that is, it, it puts us off the map. And so there's a lot that we need to think about. And, you know, there's been discussions about reshoring, which I think are absolutely worth continuing to have. 
there's been discussions about, you know, when does the, when does the bike boom end is of course a question. I'm sure every single person on this um, call has had stated to them, you know, more than once. And I think it's important to not think of it in those terms, but think of it in terms of how will it transition and what do we want it to look like moving forward. And I think that sets us up to some of the points that were brought up earlier about data, what kind of data John talked about leading indicators instead of trailing indicators. And I think that is super duper important for us all to continue to reinforce in ourselves and each other is net, let's not look at our back orders solely. Back orders, of course, are important because that allows you to deliver on the commitments you've made to your company and your customers, et cetera. But we can't let that be our, uh, our leading indicator because it's not, it's a trailing indicator. And People for Bikes has done an incredible job moving very quickly to add additional data sets and points of data to let us look at what might be indicating where we're in a transitional phase. And I think what's amazing about the time we're in now is data isn't the provenance of a few anymore. There is so much data available to so many people in so many different ways that it each stakeholder in this in this organism we call the bicycle industry has the opportunity to access data and use it to make decisions as opposed to react to what is happening to us. Yeah, I, I appreciate you um, helping to make sure I still have a job here in the bike industry providing data. <laughs> That's very important to me personally on an individual level. Um, John, anything to add? You, you mentioned agility and uh, robustness is, is necessary in the in our future state supply chain. Anything that you'd add to Andrew's? Well, I, I've seen some of the questions here, which I can kind of tie into my response. Uh, sure. You know, we you know what will be the new level of demand? I think we're all asking ourselves that. Uh, again, we look at the, I think the NPD data is great. Uh, in terms of giving us some some transparency and what's happening with demand. Uh, I mean, we now see the sell through as of, I think it was March 31st is down 17% from its high of nine and a half billion uh, last year. So it is it is slowly coming back. Will, will it go back to $6 billion? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think it'll be a, you know, a 10 to a 20% bounce from, from pre-COVID. Uh, you know, some questions here on the Asian supply chain, particularly around manufacturing. I, I think what we're going to continue to see is just consolidation with, uh, you know, across the entire supply chain. Hey, we see a lot of it right now with brands acquiring dealers. Uh, so kind of downstream, I think we're going to see more of that consolidation happening upstream with, uh, with assemblers acquiring uh, frame, uh, frame makers. We already see uh, production moving out of China and into Southeast Asia. Uh, is there any more net new capacity in Asia? I, 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 it's probably up a little bit, but not significantly. What, uh, what, what manufacturers tried to do was optimize the output of their current infrastructure during COVID, not necessarily invest in new infrastructure. But as someone alluded to, you know, certainly there was, there was the labor challenge. Uh, I do see uh, more strategic partnerships as well. So I see, uh, like I say, brands uh, uh, having a direct interest and in maybe investing directly in some manufacturers, some frame designers and some frame makers over in Asia. Uh, I do see more nearshoring in the future. Uh, the, the, the challenge with nearshoring is when we look at our industry is, is most of the components are still coming from Asia. And so even if we move the nearshoring and its final assembly over to North America, we'll still be beholden to the product and the components coming from Asia to support the assembly lines over here in North America. The beauty though of getting an assembly line nearshoring over in North America, what it will allow for is a little more agility when it comes to personalization and customization because it will be that much closer to the, to the end consumer. Um, with these, uh, with these strategic partnerships, I think we will see better transparency built into the supply chain, uh, more technology, more data share, 
blockchain, AI, bot technology, just kind of information integration across the supplier uh, a supply chain. So, so really that's a call for all of us to continue to invest in our automation journey and, and our IT roadmap. We really have to, have to invest in that. And I think some of the IT companies have said that they saw, I don't know, five or 10 years of advancement in technology during COVID. We just really, all of us have to stay on, on, on that pace. Uh, again, the capital flows, I, I see, uh, you know, dating becoming a little more prevalent in a post-COVID world. I would say, hopefully it doesn't go back to pre-COVID with, with the extended dating terms, but that uh, there might be some competitive forces that, uh, that force that. But I certainly see suppliers upstream, the manufacturers, uh, requesting and demanding more prepayments at time of order when they take a PO from a brand, uh, because what they're seeing now is is a lot a lot of uh, cancellations of these POs, and and you know they'll say they've assumed a lot of the risk if they've ordered the components, and now brands are canceling these uh, these bikes. So that's kind of what I see. Oh, sorry, the other thing I do see here is just the importance of ESG, uh, you know, the environment, social, and governance. And all of us building a more a more sustainable supply chain, and I think ESG values and practices will become more important as as we move into the future. That's that's what I have, Patrick. Oh, sorry, I'll answer one other question here about uh, product launches. Uh, I see that on on the Q and A here uh, again. This is my thought: is I, I a lot of brands have held off on releasing uh, new products during COVID just because of the disruption in the supply chain. I think 2023, we are going to see more products being launched in in the industry than any time in our history for all these product developments that brands have been working on and they've been holding. So I think next year is just going to be truly magical for all of us and all of those us who love I love new product. And next year, it's going to be like Christmas Day every day because there's going to be so much product being released. Again, that's that's uh, my my prediction on a new product going to next year. You know, will we all get into a cadence? Uh, I I don't think so. I think each brand will figure out what's best for 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 themselves and what's brand, best for their brand with respect to uh, to new product launches. John, I want to circle back to something you mentioned yep. about consolidation, kind of moving upstream. Yep. Um, how do we think that affects the risk that exists like along this linear path of dollars, units, information moving from upstream downstream? Well, well it, it, you know, if, if, if you're the prime participant of, of that partnership, uh, one of the reasons you're doing the vertical integration is to reduce your risk. Right, you're going to see a better sharing of information, right, right from the consumer, all the way up the supply chain. So there's complete visibility. That in itself should reduce some risk. Uh, again, you still have the risk that the market can react much quicker downstream than it can upstream. And that's and and that's what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, and that's what we're we're seeing now. Right, is is the the industry is not set up uh, to react as quickly upstream as it can downstream. And, and, you know, I think what we all struggle with is we don't know what consumers are going to walk in the door tomorrow. I mean, how do we predict that? Right? Uh, no one really knows that. I mean, we all have our educated guesses on that. And, you know, will all the data in the world really tell you that? Well, I, I really think, you know, there's, there's a place for data analytics and there's a place for experience. And you really got to blend the two uh, to, to come up with what uh, your bet is going to be uh, for future demand. Yeah, so let's, um, so, so there's been a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, let's, we can go ahead and transition sort of into that portion of the, the, the webinar if we'd like. Um, but I'm gonna keep focusing on the future while we're here. So there's been a few questions about um, moving manufacturing to the, to the US or, or to North America. And I don't necessarily want to answer that question, but I would yet, but um, I want to talk about risk. So, so we've talked a lot about risk today. And I think um, Andrew, you might've said it today, you might, I might've said it earlier. The, there's a time and a place, I think, for us to really have conversations about risk. Who's accepting risk? How do we, how do we interact with risk? And, and where are we comfortable putting that risk so that we know how to mitigate it 
when when something um, doesn't go in our favor. So, so you know this this notion that um, moving production domestically would reduce risk. I let, let's let's explore where that risk lands if that production moves domestic. Is that all right? It, and this could be either of you. I'd, anyone who has any thoughts on it, or we can we can jump to the next. Well, one. I think it you know it is a great um, a great conversation to keep having, and I I like John's points about the kind of the customization, some of the like the yeah. refinement of product offerings that nearshoring or reshoring offers. I think that also is a part of a little bit more agility, a little closer to market and less transit time. But, you know, it as simple and elegant as bicycles are, the making of them is complex, whether it needs to be that way or not. You know, when we looked at the tariff situation with China, you know, ostensibly built around um, US manufacturing or reinforcing US manufacturing, you know, the tires, the rim strips, the reflectors, the spokes, the nipples, the rims themselves, pedals, seats, grips. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of parts that are not also made here. And it's, you know, as John said, so much of the parts and so many of the things are made in Asia. And it took a long time to get there, <laughs> right? That didn't happen in two years. So putting it back here is going to be a, a long, hard road. And I don't necessarily know if anybody thinks that making all bikes in America again or in North America again is really the answer or what we're looking for, um, because there's certain price thresholds that consumers um, are interested in <laughs> and certain price thresholds they're not interested in. And so I think it is worth having that discussion, but I think it's also worth having that discussion as a real gritty what's involved with that and what isn't possible. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, I can add on that. I, I think it, it really depends on, on a few things moving manufacturing to, to North America. A, a you got to ask what, at what price points. I think if, if one wants to play at the lower end of the, of the pricing category, I'll say the opening price points, you really need cost leadership uh, in your manufacturers uh, in order to play in that space. And that will probably be hard to attain in North America if, if, if the manufacturing process is, is still heavily labor intensive, just because of the cost of wages uh, in North America versus over in Asia. If there's more automation, maybe you can see some of it moving uh, back to North America. I, I think the other area where you could have manufacturing in North America, if a, if a brand, and you know, again, I'm talking about a bike brand here, the, the more proprietary components they have on their bikes, the more they can design their own supply chain. The, the challenge we have is, is with many bikes. I mean, you look at how many, how many, I'll say fork suppliers are there, right? How many shock suppliers, how many drivetrain, how many brakes, right? We're all really specking the same components on our bikes. We're just kind of mixing it up. And, 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 and those, uh, those components are for the most part manufactured over in Asia. And so we'd still, we'd still be reliant on what's going on in Asia if we're gonna do the final assembly in, in North America. So, you know, I, I could probably see maybe for some upper price point uh, bikes, uh, having assembly lines in or, or having manufacturing in North America, I think it would be very difficult to, to have a competitive product in the opening price point uh, space. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, John, I'm going to keep the spotlight on you for just a sec. Um, you have a line of sight into both the U.S. market and the Canadian market, which both use the supply chain beginning at a certain point. Um, you know, they have they have different ports, but they're ultimately placing orders with a lot of the same suppliers. Can you describe any differences in how those two markets operated over the course of the last two years? Did you notice anything different? In, in one market or the other? Uh, honestly, not, not really. Uh, one, one challenge we have in Canada is we don't have access to, to market data like we have in the US. Uh, you know, the NPD, uh, all, the, all the information they give the industry, that's not available in Canada. And so in Canada, we're often looking to the NPD data and then asking ourselves, 
how relevant is that to the Canadian market? But but you know, with with respect to the supply chain, it's 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 the identical supply chain. There's some duties and customs and and some country of origin issues where it's maybe a little bit different. It's it's a little more economical in certain countries to to, to manufacture and to ship into the U.S. or or ship into Canada. Uh, but for the most part, it's 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 very similar. You know, climate would, would might might have a bit of an issue too. But then again, if you go to the northern USA, it's very similar to what's going on in Canada. Hey, you know, I'll I'll put our hand up. We uh, we sell trainers, and yeah, we experienced a big bump in trainer sales, and and now they they they've fallen off. Same things happen in Canada as happened in the U.S. with uh, with smart trainers. Uh, you know, e-bikes are are growing in Canada, much like the U.S., and so it's 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 very similar. It's very similar. What what we don't see as much in Canada, uh, but I believe it's coming, is is that vertical integration and dealer acquisition by brands. It it we're starting to see some of it, but not to the same extent as as we see in the U.S. And I would say the U.S. is a much more competitive market in general because for many brands that's their primary market and there there's always a fight over market share uh again not saying that doesn't happen in canada uh but it's it's just probably just dialed up a little bit more in in the us than than in canada yeah so you mentioned um pedal bikes or muscle bikes and e-bikes just a moment ago muscle bikes i think was an andrew kemp uh, <laughs> uh quote but i i love it yeah um do either of you see any noticeable differences in how those, those two supply chains, um, you know, sort of similarly the U.S. and Canada, they they share a lot of common common touch points along the supply chain, but they still operate a little bit differently. Um, do either of you two have any insight into like notable differences and how those two are working, or or we think could work in the future? You mean uh, the e-bike supply chain versus the muscle bike supply chain? Yeah, yeah. Sorry if that, that wasn't clear. Um, I think, yeah, there are differences, right? Because as we've seen, the bike space is a real small player in some of the industries that we source those components from. So semiconductors and battery technology, that's, there's, that's a double-edged sword in a lot of regards because automotive or aerospace has always done a lot of really terrific development that the bike industry has been able to grab on, right? If you think about what aerospace did with titanium or what it's done with carbon fiber, it's been really beneficial for the bike space. I think automotive and battery technology will probably help drive that, but ultimately we're still a really small player. So it, the semiconductor sh uh, chip shortage is a real, or semiconductor and chip shortage is a real issue that is affecting the bike industry. And we're just small, small paltry player there asking, can we have your scraps, please? Um, so it's something that we have to be a part of and thinking that we're not in this tiny little ecosystem anymore. Um, that's probably some of the biggest differences I've seen um, between the two is, you know, our, the bike industry supply chain is fairly closed. But once you get to the e-bike side, now we're at a much, much bigger table. I think the other interesting thing is on the development side, e-bike is driving a lot more conversations around collaboration from multiple suppliers collaborating towards a better rider experience with the bike designer. Because of the nature of electronics, stuff has to be able to talk to each other. And I think that is super duper exciting because it gets us all out of our development silos and talking more about what benefits the rider and how can we deliver that. Amazing. Um, John, anything to add about pedal bikes and e-bikes supply chains? Uh, you know, it's very interesting. I think what we'll see from the technology side, the pace of change will be much quicker on e-bikes uh, for the next uh, number of years. Uh, certainly, I think there'll be more competition, particularly on the pavement side uh, and some of the D to C brands. Uh, you have the automotive companies and some power sport companies. They, they see an opportunity on e-bikes. Again, I think primarily, though, on the on the pavement space. I think our industry is well positioned because I think our channel, I mean, what's, what's, what's wonderful about the e-bike, it requires that, that service, right? It requires that expertise to work on it. So, so that bodes very well for, for our dealer base. Uh, you know, in Asia, 
Uh, it's, it's generally the same uh, assemblers are putting the e-bikes together as they're putting the muscle bikes together. By the way, Andrew, I haven't heard that term muscle bikes, but, but that is, I like that better than acoustic uh, muscle bikes. Uh, this webinar is recorded, so it's now... Um, it's official. It's now a, a the, other, the other one I heard the other day was lithium bikes versus electrolyte bikes. Okay. Electrolyte bikes, that's good. <laughs> And then the other thing, again, this might just be temporary, but certainly the cost, the, the, the freight on e-bikes, uh, they're, they're noted as dangerous cargo with the battery, uh, becomes a lot more challenging and, and a lot more expensive. But again, that's just something we have to manage our way through. Uh, and, and, you know, where, where, where do I see a, a, a lot of improvements happening with e-bikes is really around uh, battery. I mean, batteries weigh, weigh quite a bit these days. If, if we can get the weight of the battery down and the range and the output uh, extend that, that, that'll be phenomenal for our industry. And I think a lot of that development won't necessarily happen inside the auto, sorry, inside the bike industry. It might transfer over from, uh, from communication or the automotive, uh, uh, the, the automotive space. Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, this next question could go to either of you, I think. <laughs> Who do you think is most likely to carry extra inventory or a safety stock in a post-COVID world, given the expense? Um, raw material suppliers, manufacturers, retailers, or everybody in that chain? You know, I will, I would, I will answer the question just slightly different. I, I think brands are going to be required to fund more of the inventory wherever it may be in the supply chain. And so I think uh, manufacturers are going to look to the brands to, uh, to, to prepay on orders. Uh, and I think dealers are going to be asking for, for some additional dating, you know, versus what's happened over the last two years. So, so I think there's going to be uh, intensive capital requirements by brands and suppliers to fund both downstream and, and upstream. And so where will the inventory actually be, uh, be placed? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, yeah, you'd, 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 you'd like, uh, you, you want the agility. So you do want it as close to the consumer as possible, but that requires a big buffer stock. You know, ideally we'd want shorter lead times. So if we can get shorter lead times, then I think there'd be a big, you know, more inventory held way upstream if, if we can get uh, shorter lead times on the manufacturer. But, but again, I think to me, I turned around to capital and I think suppliers and brands are going to have to have deeper pockets going forward. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. Where do we see demand for accessories like helmets, lights, and shoes going um, based on bike sales over the last two years, right? So there's there's this product that's required to be like a, a bicyclist, and then there's all these parts and accessories that support that activity. Um, how do we see that demand reacting to the increased number of bicycles we've seen over the last two years? Andrew, I saw you come off mute for a sec. Well, I think um, similarly to uh, John's previous answer, where I would state that slide, I would. <laughs> take that and let's make it a bigger a bigger discussion around what do we what do we want that transition phase to look like as we exit the bike boom and as the pandemic continues to evolve now we have all these people riding bikes how interested in keeping them and what are we prepared to do to keep them that will drive the answer to the question of accessories traditionally the intuitive response has been as a hard goods market matures, soft goods follow suit. So as something stabilizes, you can expect soft goods to be kind of a trailer to that. Um, and we can look in other sports to validate that statement. But because we're in such a strange, you know, as I stated before, off the map, <laughs> then I think it's a good time to have a discussion of how do we want to hold on to those people? How do we want to engage them on their journey as becoming maybe instead of somebody who has a bike, but somebody who rides a bike and somebody maybe even self-identifies as a cyclist, how we do that will drive that accessory conversation in a completely different way versus like just thinking about um, the point I made earlier about the transition versus uh, the end of a bike boom, right? If, if we don't engage with those new riders, then accessories will plummet in sales. If we engage and keep them 
on their journey at, towards becoming cyclists or staying cyclists, then those, those accessory numbers will continue to grow. Yeah, People for Bikes at the end of 2020 published our bicycling, no, I stand, it, it was our COVID participation study, that's what we called it. Um, and we looked at those who started riding during the pandemic, those who switched up the type of riding they were doing during the pandemic. So they might've just been riding indoors on a trainer in 2019, going to a gym or, or a health club or something. And then gyms were closed and they, they moved outside. They started riding outside. They bought, they bought a bike, they bought a helmet, they bought shoes, whatever. Um, and we looked at you know, the barriers that existed pre-pandemic. Why did they not ride? They didn't have time. Well, that's not true. We all have the same 24 hours. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't an activity they were interested in. They started writing during the pandemic and they want to keep writing. And, and we know what's going to keep them writing because they, they told us in this questionnaire. And it's a lot of things that are in our control. It's things like how to get them information on where to ride, what routes they can, they can take, like what they can expect when they get to a trailhead so that they feel comfortable going out on this, this ride by themselves maybe. Um, and it's a sense of community. So like a lot of these riders were starting to ride in an environment where there were no group rides leaving the shop. There were no large events to ride 60 miles around Denver or whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of these little levers that we can pull in this like choose your own adventure story here where we can, we can take control of some of this demand by keeping folks interested in cycling through creating a sense of community, welcoming them into the, the fold as cyclists. You know, now that brick and mortar shops have been open for a while, we have the opportunity to interface with them in a way that's gonna help them stay interested in cycling. Um, that's a lever we can pull to keep that accessory demand high. I'll also say that, that what we saw in bike demand in 2020 was both an influx of new riders purchasing bikes and existing riders who are typically on this like, four or five, six year purchase cycle where every every four, five, six years they'll buy a new bike. That timeline got really shortened because we all had greater disposable income if we received stimulus checks. We had fewer other opportunities for outdoor recreation or for, for leisure activities. Um, and so some of those accessories like helmets that you can you can use the same helmet for a road bike as you are a gravel bike maybe. Um, some of those like bundled goods were different for that, that segment of existing riders than new riders. We saw new riders purchasing bike, helmet, shoes, and shorts all in the same transaction. Um, but we also saw disproportionately more just bikes in that same time because those existing riders were just adding a bike to the arsenal. So, so it's a little bit different for these like on bike accessories as opposed to like helmets, shorts, that sort of thing um, that's transferable across types of riding. So um, I, I'll put that the link to that study in the chat too. I didn't have that one prepared, but I'm gonna I'll, I'll get that really quick. Um, I, I think that's all of the questions that we have here. Well, let's see. Um, I think we already answered this one. How will the new environment affect the model year go to market plan that we have been used to? Do we think that we will start to experience? An environment of new product deliveries when ready rather than on a calendar. John, I see you nodding. I, again, I, I'm, I think the best answer is it depends. Every brand will have their own strategy with respect to product launches, uh, but it's in no one's interest to hold bikes in the warehouse if there's consumer demand for uh, for the new product. But Again, you got to time the launch with uh, with when you expect that consumer demand to be at uh, you know to to be at its peak or growing. I, I like the question here from Daniel Limberg. Uh, some suppliers have lead times that are thirty six months out, but their ERP system only allows orders to be placed twenty four months out. How do you suggest handling that? <laughs> you, you know, my experience over the last couple of years is, is the best information I have is when a bike is, is, is on a can loaded and anything that's not on a can, I discount significantly. So uh, I, I just don't think anything that's, that, that's even nine or 12 months out, it is so hard to predict. And, and you just have to discount that information as, as sad as it sounds. And, that, and that's, that's what's wrong with our supply chain, right? I'd have no confidence 24, 36 months old. 
Yeah. We're, we're at time. I would say that about our company. Okay. That, that could be against yeah. our company. And so I'm not saying that's other companies. That's our company. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there. there. There's a couple more questions in there, but um, I'd really love to keep the conversation going offline. Um, yeah. My Kyler, if you can go to the last slide, we have our contact information there. If anyone has any questions for me, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and I'm going to leave us with a nugget that Andrew said. Um, if we're offered the opportunity to either guess about what the future supply chain will look like or, or like make a statement of purpose regarding what we want our collective future to look like, I think we'd all agree that um, the latter is going to serve us better in the long term. So um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we had significantly more attendees for this webinar than, than our typical webinars, so I'm flattered. Um, People for Bikes is here to provide data and research to help you navigate the marketplace. And so feel free to reach out with any questions, anything we can do to help you navigate that marketplace. And we'll see you in our next webinar. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Kyler. Thank you, John. And thank you to everybody that uh, took time out of a very, very busy, busy schedule to uh, attend this. Thank you guys very much. I second Absolutely. that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Cheers.